I'm going to talk a little bit about the Office of the Indigent Defense in Hidalgo County. Um, then I'm going to hand it over to Jimmy so he can talk to you guys about the Public Defender's Office over there. Um, I want to talk about the business process and the workflow that goes on in Hidalgo County, how we started our office. For those of you that don't have an Indigent Defense Office in your county that maybe you want to get one started, um, you can find out more or less how we started ours and what kind of obstacles that we had to go through. And one of the biggest things that helped me accomplish my goals is understanding and learning how to deal with politics. That's a big issue where I'm from, and I don't know if it's a big issue where you guys are from. I know that there's uh, commissioners and judges and stuff, uh, coordinators here in the audience. And really, it's a big, uh, a big obstacle. It's, uh, some people like to talk about politics, and other people avoid it like the plague. Like my mom, she always said, you know, you don't discuss politics and religion at the table, at the dinner table. You know, she didn't want to talk about it. But understanding politics is very important to get from point A to point B, which is uh, your plan and your goal. You know, if uh, in a perfect world, I guess it's a straight line, but we don't live in a perfect world. And it sort of looks like that information highway that we saw earlier, you know. I mean, and usually those obstacles that we have, it's dealing with uh, politics. Now, Webster's uh, definition of politics is the art or science concerned with winning and holding control over a government or office, which is, I guess, like your typical uh, political race. You're running for office for whatever. Uh, the second one is the total complex of relations between people living in a society. This is, I guess, uh, an example would be like uh, little Jimmy plays for the football team, and he's the best center on the team, but the second center on the team happens to be the nephew of the coach, so who's going to get the playing time? You know, the nephew, right? So understanding these things can help you with your project. It can save you a lot of headaches, learning how to weave and go through the, that, uh, those obstacles. Now, a little history on Hidalgo County. We're the seventh largest county in Texas population of 725,000 plus. We're a border county, so we share a, county, uh, a border with uh, Reynosa, Tamaulipas, and Nuevo Progreso. So I don't know if you've heard of all the violence that's going on in Reynosa, Mexico, uh, but that's basically in our backyard. We have 10 district courts, six county courted laws, and we average yearly uh, about 22,662 criminal cases per year. Now, in 2003, we had two hot topics, major hot topics in Hidalgo County, and you might be going through this right now, some of you. Uh, one of it was the jail population. We're busting at the seams, and we're in the process in 2003 of getting a new jail. Well, they hired, uh, the commissioners hired an independent consultant from the University of Texas Pan American by the name of Dr. Etheridge, and he did a study, and he was doing a study on the growth of the county. And what he was saying was that a year after you open your doors to your new county, you're going to be back in the same spot. You're going to have to be housing inmates to, your, to other counties. So what the commissioners did in anticipation of that, they set $3 million aside to address that, that issue. Okay? So that was more of an issue over here on the commissioner's side. Over here in the count, at the courthouse with the district and county court law judges, the big deal was the Senate Bill 7. That was a hot topic. So we're trying to find ways to see how we're going to attack, you know, those, uh, those issues. Well, who decided to also weigh in on the hot topic was politics again. We had uh, attorneys going to judges saying, we're not going to be able to meet our 24-hour statute to go meet our client once we're, we're, we're appointed. How do you expect us to drive out to the new jail 12 miles to 12 miles back? I mean, it's just cutting it too close. We had uh, magistrate judges that were saying, well, we already do our, our job. We already magistrate everyone within 24 hours. But in reviewing the records, we saw that that's not necessarily you know, the, the case. So what we did is we went out and we received our formula grant for, in 2003 for 200, 271,000 plus, And we got a discretionary grant of 115 thousand to get video teleconferencing equipment and an indigent defense coordinator. So our plan was to start a little office to tackle those issues. And in doing so, 
uh, we tried to play a little bit of politics and we uh, lobbied the commissioners and we told them, look, if we can get this office going, maybe it can help alleviate the pressure at the jail. We'll get an attorney to them right away. They'll be able to work on bonds. Uh, they should be able to get them out, hopefully, and we should have room in our jails. So we did that, and then we got the video teleconferencing equipment also, which we offered to the Justice of the Pieces uh, so they can do their magistration over the video teleconferencing. We only had two judges on board at that time, uh, and this prevented them from having to go to the jail to go do those magistrations. They just go into their office and they do it from there. They bring the inmates in front of the camera and they take care of business that way. Well, after seeing that, the other judges started getting a little jealous and they said, well, where's my stuff? I want, I want, I want in on the action. So now, luckily, everybody is 100% in compliance or they're on board with the video magistration. We also have the teleconferencing equipment for the attorney client visitation. Uh, so we were able to calm the attorneys down with that and tell them, look, while you're working your cases in between cases at the courthouse, go into our office and you can get your defendant on the video teleconferencing uh, camera and then you can visit your client that way and you can meet your 24-hour statute. So they love that. So that was a good deal for them. Okay, currently we have on staff uh, seven employees. We have our overseer, we have a program director, compliance monitor, uh, systems integrator, and four coordinators, okay? Um, the systems integrator, what he does is that he collects data from uh, the magistration forms submitted by municipal and JP courts. He compiles reports, assures that all computer hardware, software, and other electronic communications be technologically integrated. He's like our computer guy. Um, our IT department, to get them to do stuff for us, we, we got a, we're on a waiting list. And since I'm not politically connected anyway, I'm always at the bottom of the list. You know? So I decided to go ahead and hire someone that can take care of that, that for us on staff. Then we have uh, our indigent defense coordinators. We have four of those. Three of them are housed at the county jail, and one of them is housed at the courthouse. We have two offices. We have one at the county jail and one at the courthouse. Uh, they interview inmates requesting court-appointed counsel and gather the financial information and reports and monitors timeliness on attorney-client visitation to the jail. Our compliance monitor is like our in-house um, auditor. He makes sure that everyone's meeting their timelines. Uh, the magistration time period, attorney appointment time period, attorney acceptance and decline response, the attorney visitations, attorney CLE requirements, and attorney application. The workflow, the way it works in our office over there in Indian Defense, an accused is booked into the county jail, and everybody is bonded out at the county. We have 23-plus uh, municipalities. Um, just like the, the, the people that, that presented before us, uh, nobody can get released or should be getting released out of the municipal courts. Everybody needs to be booked in and released at the county jail. So that gives us a chance to go ahead and visit everyone that we need to visit and ask them if they want a court-appointed attorney. If they're arrested by the sheriff's office and they have no uh, bond, they haven't been seen by a magistrate, they're seen by the JP via video teleconferencing. The uh, in the jail indigent uh, defense coordinator interviews every detainee for a court-appointed attorney. And what they have is a, like a little mobile desk cart unit. They have a laptop on there, and they do everything electronically. They actually go to the back of the, of the jail cells, and they visit their clients there uh, on site. And everything's done electronic. They sign everything on those uh, signature pads. And once all the applications are done, then they're sent to the coordinator at the courthouse. Once the application is returned to the courthouse, the coordinator at the courthouse sends the appointed uh, the the application to the to the judge for signature. Um, they didn't give us the authority to appoint. Um, the judges said, "No, we want to appoint the, the the attorneys. So just bring them to us, and we have them on a rotation." And that's the way we work that. Uh, the attorney sends in the acceptance or decline form back to our office, and then we monitor the, the attorney until he's made his initial visit. After that, we're, we're out of it. We don't have uh, 
anything else to do with it. Um, but now we have an attorney with him right away. We have, uh, we alleviated a little bit of the jail population. But now um, we noticed that we were spending a lot of money on attorney fees. It almost tripled since we started. So now we're trying to find solutions uh, as to how to attack this problem. We saved here, but now we're spending more over here, as I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat. So what we did was that we came up with an idea of bringing in a public defender's office to try to alleviate the cost on that. So I went to one of the judges and I told him, Judge, uh, I, I need a point man. I need someone to, uh, to go up to bat for us. I need someone with some, you know, with some meat on their bones to go up and, and fight for this cause. And he said, you know what, it sounds like a good idea. I showed him the plan. I showed him everything, how I was going to save money. And he said, you know what, I'll, I'm going to go for it. Okay. Two weeks later, I go back so we can crunch some numbers, you know, get our plan going. And the judge says, uh, you know what, uh, I would thought about it, and I don't think it's a good idea. I think we got to scratch it. What do you mean, Judge? You know, why? Well, it's because I was talking to some of the private attorneys, and they were saying, you know, they're going to take our bread money away. You know, I mean, we're going to lose we're going to lose money here. So this judge, he was up for election, and that's one of the reasons why I went to him, because I said, look, Judge, uh, maybe this is a good thing for your, you know, to show your constituents that you're the, fo the founding father of the public defender's office in Hidalgo County. We've never had one. This is the first time, you know, everyone's going to do it. So I thought he'd be a good candidate for it, and he went along for it for two weeks, and then he said, no, it's not going to fly. <laughs> so I told him, politics, why do we have to play the game of politics, right? Well, because it's there, and we need to realize that. So luckily, we have more than one county court law judge. Luckily, it's the majority that rules. So I went to the next candidate. And this judge had just won his election. So he had four years that he, he could play with. So I told him what happened with the other judge. And uh, he said, you know what, I think I'll go for it. I said, if it doesn't work, you can be the hero that scratched it in four years. And you know, you can use that for your campaign, you know? <laughs> so he said, you know what, I'm gonna go for it, let's do it. So we put our plan together. We got a grant from the task force. And we went out and we hired a public defender. And I'm going to hand it over to Jimmy so he can tell his part of the equation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Jimmy Gonzalez. Uh, my part is that I was appointed public defender and everybody hates me. All defense attorneys hate me. Basically, it's my part. But um, yeah, Sid was saying, I I I'm not connected either. He's too modest. He's worked hard. Um, was speaking to all the judges, and that's going to be basically the theme of my presentation, is getting everybody to work together. He, he's, everybody knows him. He goes to all the judges. He talks to them straightforward, like he did with you today, and, and he has all their ear, and um, he, they listen to him, basically. And that's what happened when I came in. Um, I was appointed. I'm a former district, assistant district attorney, so it wasn't very nice when I came in. All the criminal defense attorneys didn't like that. It wasn't one of their own, so I had a lot of heat, but something very cool happened. Um, Bob Spangenberg came down from the, with the task force, him and his little group of people, and he basically had a big old bat, and he knocked the hornet's nest, okay? And if you can imagine, we're in South Texas uh, along the border, and I'm having to go to judges saying, I got this, these guys from Boston named Bob Spangenberg are going to talk to you about indigent defense, and you know, nobody wanted to talk to him. Nobody could pronounce his name. And, you know, everybody was freaking out. They thought he was from Harvard. I mean, it was all these rumors going around, and the county talk, calling me, and I'm like, this is some guy. Don't worry, he's going to talk to you, no big deal. But what he did was, and me being you, and working at the DA's office, it, it allowed me to talk to all different players in the criminal justice process. And that's what I'm thankful about them uh, so much, me starting out. I think they came within the first couple of weeks of, of existence of the office, so... I think it was just me in a picnic table, basically in an office. That's all it was. So we went to the JPs, municipal court judges, the auditor's office, the budget office, the county jail, um, the DA's office, misdemeanor intake section. We went through every different section, and Boss Benjamin just asked the same question every time. What is your problem? 
What is the problem going on? What's the problem with the, with the energy defense process? And all these problems came up. I'll never forget it. After he left, he goes, now your work starts. And I go, well, sure, I'm going to represent guys and, you know, they're in custody. I'm going to go to trial. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you're a politician now. He goes, now your work starts. Keep it simple, stupid, and make them understand. And I go, you know, well, make who understand? Everybody. You got to make everybody understand what the problem is. And as Sid kind of talked about, politics is the big game. I mean, that's, it's no secret. But everybody has to understand what the problem is and how can you fix it. Because you fix one side, and another problem pops up on the other side. So my main theme is what has worked with us, and, and Sid deserves all the credit for this, as being my mentor with the, with the commissioners and the county court judges and everybody, is communication. We need to create a working dialogue that everyone can understand. And what I mean by that is, you know, I know there's auditors here, engine defense coordinators, uh, county judges. I don't know about your counties, but in our county currently, our commissioners and county judges, none of them are attorneys. Some are businessmen, some have, one was a former county clerk, so he has experience with the criminal justice process, but the process is not understood by everybody. I can talk about arrest to release, about disposition dates, about filing of records, and no one understands what's going on. So that's the first step, create a working dialogue. With Sid's help, with the task force help, with Bob Spangenberg's help, um, when he knocked that hornet's nest, I think everybody kind of realized we need to get together. So we've created these criminal justice workshops. Now, in all honesty, they should be done quarterly, let's say, or monthly, where we have meetings that, are, you know, that we all can talk about and it used to be like that, but it just tapers off. So I need to be more diligent to get that going again. Everybody does, I guess. But in these workshops, you need to invite all the players in the criminal justice process. This is common sense stuff, but you know, I don't know if you guys do it or not. Um, and what I mean by that is everybody that's here, auditors, budget, county jail representatives, everybody, DA's office, um, public defenders, members of the defense bar, okay? County clerk's office, district clerk's office, collections department, if you have that in your county. Um, identify the goals of every player in the process, identify the bottlenecks, understand why the bottlenecks occur, and find solutions together. And when that happens, amazing things start to happen, okay? Um, now for our goals, energy and defense goals, quickly and efficiently uh, interview and identify all individuals requesting assistance um, and make sure they're eligible. And for my point of view, provide the highest level of representation possible. That's the energy and defense goal. What's the county goal? Real easy, save us money. And, and it, it, it's, it, it was, it's ridiculous. I, I remember the first time I went to commissioner's court and I'd say maybe about a couple of months after we started and I was so happy because we had a couple of trials that we won. That, you know, and I'm like, hey, we're public defenders, we won a couple of trials. You know, all my attorneys are, I think I was the most experienced guy and I, I don't know, I was, I was I was 29 years old or something like that, and I go, we won a couple of trials, I'm very happy. Well, as Sid showed you the numbers, well, our costs keep rising. Well, and our jail population is still rising. Well, yeah, but, you know, we got a couple of dismissals, and, and who cares, you know, nobody cares. And I go, well, all right. And I didn't get to finish my speech, she just interrupted me, and I'm just, okay, thank you, thank you, and I went off, and I forgot what I said, and I just walked off, and that was horrible, but you know what? That's what Bob Spencer was telling me. You, you got to make them understand because these goals are interrelated. And I'm glad they are because what it does is it puts a fire under my butt to, to innovate, okay? Because if not, I'd, I'd be sitting there happy with my, you know, my trials. We want a couple. It takes a couple of weeks, eh, a couple of months. It's fine. We're getting guys out. No big deal. But it can't work like that because the reality is I want my job and I want the Public Defender's Office to remain a, a county department. And I'm happy to say, by the way, last month, our grant ended, uh, our four-year grant from the task force, and we were picked up as an official county department 100%. So we're a county department now. They, you know, they can't, I'm very happy about that, actually. Thank you. Actually, yeah, yesterday was our four-year anniversary, so it's, it's, I'm very happy. Um, so what I did with that is we got all the information from the Spanjiver group, and I put it in a simple flow chart to present to the commissioners, and they loved it, because everybody can see what the problem is, okay? And this is the flow chart that I presented. Now, it's real simple, and the numbers here are kind of a little bit old, but you can kind of see where I went at, because it created the working dialogue for everybody to talk to, 
and I go, look, it. this represents our misdemeanor jail cases only. And these are guys that are in jail when we first see them, and we can't get them out for various reasons. Uh, with us, it's mainly immigration holds. And when they're released, and I go, these are the, this is the process. You got to rest, then we get appointed by an agent of defense, then we do our interview, then the complaint gets signed by the district attorney. They, they accept the, the charge, and it gets uh, filed in a county court of law, and the court hears the case, and I don't know about your counties, but in ours, probably 95% of jail cases plea guilty right away. I mean, rarely do they go to trial, so most often they're, they plea in a court date and they're released. So you could see that whole process takes about 17.2 days, and I did this because, as Sid showed you, one of the big problems was the raising jail population in our county. So I put this out there and I go, look, this is what we're doing, and we've reduced that. I think now we're down to 12 days or something in our cases, and you compare that to uh, the court-appointed attorneys or private defense bar, I think they're still around 17 or 18 days. And I could tell them very simply, that's $50 a day per inmate uh, to house them. We're saving that amount, of, that amount of money, the difference, whatever that difference is, per inmate. In dollars and cents is how I present it, and they pay attention to that. So they start asking the questions. Well, why does it take 10.3 days from arrest to the complaint signed? Well, I don't know. Ask the people that, know, that are in charge of that. Ask the DA's office. Well, it takes us 10.3 days because the police department doesn't do the reports fast enough. Okay, let's go ask the police department. Well, we do it, and, and everybody kept passing the buck, okay? But the point is, is that now there was an identifiable bottleneck. It takes 10.3 days to get a case to get filed. It shouldn't be taking that long. Another bottleneck from the arrest, well, if you can see kind of in there from the complaint getting signed to the court hearing, 6.7 days. I mean, that's a lot of days. I mean, once the case is filed, why does the court take seven days almost to get the case back into court? Again, there was different passing the buck. Well, the DA's office takes a while. Then there's one girl who picks up the DA's office. I mean, this is how rudimentary it is. There's one girl who picks up the DA's office, takes down to the clerks. There's one person at the clerk's office who reviews them and files the case. Well, she was absent last week. So it took uh, a little bit longer. Okay, that can't be happening. But these were the kind of, this spurred the conversation, I guess, to everybody can understand. And this is what the most valuable thing that, that um, I think helped me with the commissioners and with the auditor's office, because what's happening still today is that the budget and the auditor's office are coming up with ideas and plans without talking to anybody else. I mean, they're, you know, in our county, the county judges just recently raised the, um, the attorney fee levels. And, uh, you know, the budget office is kind of freaking out a little bit with the new amounts, and they want to do big changes. And, you know, and I'm going, well, have you talked to anybody? Well, no, not really. I mean, talk with the judges. What's wrong with you guys? I mean, it just seems very simple. They're asking me, and I go, I don't know what the answer is. But when there's a working dialogue created, everybody can kind of see what the problems are and, and, and I guess, help out together. Now, what we've done with the public defender's office is try to be proactive, not reactive. And I think that of all the things about the public defender's office, this is our greatest asset. We can afford to do this. Uh, um, we're not private defense attorneys that have civil clients and divorce cases and hearings, or we have one client that's paying us $20,000 to do a federal drug case and another one paying us $1,000. We have the time to be proactive. What we're doing is we do weekly inmate roster checks. Okay, we can run that through the computer program with the, that the county has. It's called Able Term, and are able to see in any court. This guy's been in jail for 85 days, and he fell through the cracks. What's going on? We can call the courts, file this case, and they're happy to. We can uh, push police departments to file faster, and we've done that. We have we developed a position called our intake officer, who that's all she that's all she does. She calls this case. We can see it's. Uh, whatever, Officer Rodriguez, you haven't filed on this case yet, case number, whatever, whatever, let me talk to your supervisor. It gets filed faster. We file bar reductions on everything, okay? I don't care if the guy has a rap sheet three miles long, we file a bond reduction on him. I don't care if they're here illegally, we file a bond reduction on him. And what it does is it goes to the judges, the judges ask the questions, why is he in jail for 20 days on a $55 shoplifting case? We need to get it filed. He gets angry at the DA's office, the DA's anger gets angry at the police department, I imagine. The case gets filed in two days, okay? 
Um, we contact the courts, set cases faster. And this is something that we've been doing recently, is working with the county jail. Um, they have real concerns. They have MHMR patients, they have patients that have injuries, and they're actually now calling me and saying, hey, this is not one of your cases, but can you do some kind of bond reduction on him? Well, what's the deal? Well, I mean, it's, I, I, he has H1N1, or he has some kind of uh, illness that we're having to pay for him now to go to the, you know, the, the city hospital, and we don't want to do that. He's an American citizen. Can you get him out? His attorney's not, he didn't request one, or he's not doing anything. Yeah, we help him out. So we're becoming a resource for county departments to save them money, okay? Now, no problems, only solutions. What has this done? By no means am I saying the jail population has decreased or gone down. It did for a while, but like anything, we have high population. We're right next to Reynosa, which I think has about a million people or something. It, they come, you know, that undocumented workers in, in our county probably is another three or 400,000 any given day. So, but population has stabilized. Cost house inmates out of county has stabilized. Inmates arrest to release has decreased, and our representation hasn't been compromised. And I think that's the biggest key. We're working faster, but we haven't compromised our representation. Everything is stabilized, commissioners are happy. Well, I don't know they're happy, but they're, they're satisfied with the, with the progress. And for us, the public defender's office, for a pitch for public defenders, um, you know, they're seeing that we're a valuable asset. And we're in talks now to increase our caseload by another 30 to 40 percent in, in the next couple of months. And a talks to increase, uh, give us two or three more attorneys. And this is a time where, you know, county budgets are so tough where there's no raises, there's hiring freezes, but we're seen as a viable solution to the problem. So um, I hope you guys can work together. And again, if I can give any kind of advice that Boss Vendrew gave me was just keep it simple, stupid, and everybody will work together and there's solutions we can all find together. Thank you.